Welcome to Marvin Nye Methodist Church's Sunday morning broadcast from our beautiful historic sanctuary in downtown Tyler, Texas. We're glad that you joined us. Today, we continue a sermon series entitled, Strength for the Vision. As pillars provide strength for a building, so the pillars of our new strategic plan provide strength for us to accomplish God's unique vision for our church. Each Sunday, you'll hear a biblical teaching on a different pillar, so let's join in as the sermon is underway. Jesus sends out the 72. After the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he's about to go, he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, Go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I'll tell you, it will be more bearable on that day from Sodom than the town, for, than from that town. This is the word of God from the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I have a question for you. Before that, let's pray. Lord God, in the midst of this time and as this word is proclaimed, I pray that you might speak through me and bless the words spoken, that they may encourage our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. So the question I want to ask this morning, do you think that Jesus was ever disappointed in people? What do you think? I think he was disappointed in people, but I do believe also that even though he may have been disappointed with people and sometimes their shortcomings, I don't think that Jesus ever gave up on people. I believe that Jesus knew that the Father's plan was that the sharing of the gospel of the good news was going to be through people. How many of you heard the gospel shared from a person? How many of you were brought to church by a person or driven to church by a person? The people is how the gospel gets spread throughout the world. It is God's intention that the kingdom gets spread around the world, person to person, and that is the way in which God will do it. It is plan A, and friends, there is no plan B. God intends to use all of us to be a part of this work of his kingdom. In fact, in the scripture, you may have heard the very familiar words when Jesus said, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out people into the harvest field. Because why? The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. What we're going to talk about today in this time that we have together is the importance of all of us being involved in the harvest work of Jesus Christ. So if you've got your bulletin and you're taking notes today, I've got a pen in there in the pew for you. You've got your back of your bulletin to write a few things down. Quickly, three things I want to say this morning. I believe, first of all, Jesus believes in you. He believes in people, and even though he may be disappointed at times in some people, he will always return to ask others to be involved. He believes in people. That's the first one. And secondly, hospitality is at the center of the mission. Hospitality is critical to the mission that we will do. And lastly, the third point will be, it will be this. As we advance God's kingdom, we must invest in those who are receptive, so those are the three things we want to talk about. And the first one is pretty easy, but if we had read the end of chapter 9, you could have seen this. I'm going to summarize it for you. But the end of chapter 9, Jesus has three walkaways. Jesus has asked three individuals to follow him. One actually instigates the conversation, comes and says, I'll go wherever you go, Lord. And he says, well, you know, I have no home. I have no place to lay my head. And we don't know what happened except that the guy just walked away. And after that, Jesus asked another one, will you follow me? He says, well, I've got to do something first. I've got to go bury my father. That's a great reason, but it's an excuse. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. I need you to follow me. I need you to preach the gospel. And then the third person who's asked to follow, he simply asked to follow. And they say, let me say goodbye to my family first. Let me go home and say goodbye. I think Jesus knew the guy's mother. 
I think he knew if he went home to his mother and the mother made a nice meal and he might get a great meal in him and then his mom might start talking to him like, yeah, how well do you know this Jesus guy? Do you really think that's a good idea? And he might end up changing his mind. I don't know. Do you ever know any moms like that? I don't know. But anyway, three failures. But then friends, if you open up chapter 10 where the scripture began that Hyde read, after this, after three failures, Jesus appoints the 72. He appoints the 72 to go out, and he's going to appoint them to go out ahead of him into the small towns around the Sea of Galilee. He's going to invite them to go into to their homes and stay in their homes, build relationships with those individuals. And then when he arrives to begin to preach, <clears throat> those individuals will bring those, those families to come and hear the word proclaimed. That's the mission. And so think about it, 72 are going out all around the Sea of Galilee, and it's an expansion time in the ministry. We've gone from 12, and now we're going to 72. And think about it, how many of you have ever been to a mission training event? You're going on a mission trip, and so you're called up to the church, and the leader says, here is a brochure, here's a pamphlet for you. It's going to explain to you where we're going, what to bring in your bag, right? It's going to talk about what's expected of you and certain things you need to know. How many of you have had that kind of an experience? Raise your hand if you have. I've had that kind of experience. That's a very helpful thing before you go on a trip. So put yourself in that mindset as we discuss the, uh, the, what Jesus is going to do in these words of instruction. <clears throat> He's going to say, first of all, there's 72 of you. And if I was there, I'd say, Jesus, why 72? Why is it important that we have 72 of us? And I want to just take a moment to talk about this number 72, why I think it is important. I believe it's important because we see a progression of numbers in the Bible from 70 to 71 to 72 now. So let's go back to the, if you're taking notes, Numbers 11, 14 and 20 through 25. Moses is wandering through the wilderness. He's brought the people out of Egypt. He's listened to the complaints of the people. They've had one problem after another. They've been rebellion and there's been stiff neckedness about them. And he's like crying out to God. You look it up in number, uh, Numbers 11, 14. He's like, God, can you please help me out here? This burden is too great for me. And what does God say? Moses, go find just 70 people. Go find 70 people. And the spirit that I have put on you, I will put within them, and they will help you carry the load of leading the people. I love that. Friends, that is a precursor to the Pentecost event. That is the precursor to the church. That is the Holy Spirit coming upon those who are called by God as elders to lead in the church, to lead us. And there is nothing better than 70 on fire God fearing people who have the Holy Spirit working in them who are directed on a mission. And Moses gets a taste of it there in Numbers 11. God makes provision and he is going to put his spirit upon those individuals. Why? Because the work of the church, the work of God is not, cannot be done by just one person. Amen? It must be done by a group of individuals that God will inspire and bring together. So the 70 starts with Moses, and then we, fa we fast forward ahead, and we know that the Jewish community has come together. They now have a temple in Jerusalem, and we now have a group called the Sanhedrin. I learned something this week. The word Greek for council is Sanhedrin. So that's the word Sanhedrin. It was a Greek word for the council, the council of the Jews. And it was 71 individuals. They probably wanted to go with the numbers in 70, like Moses had been called to have 70 elders of the community. But then they realized if you have 70, you can't take a vote, and you could possibly have a split vote, right? 35, 35, so they made it 71. Well, here comes Jesus. He's now got a vision. He's taking the gospel out, not just into Jerusalem, not just in the Sea of Galilee. His vision is for the world. And Luke has this vision. Luke is the gospel that's written with the audience of the gospel is going out to the world. It's going to everybody. Jesus chooses the number 72. Why is that? We're seeing a progression, 70, 71, now 72. Guess what? 72 is divisible by what? 12. 
12, a very special number, 12 disciples, 12 tribes, 12 in numerology has to do with wholeness, it has to do with completeness, it has to do with authority, and Jesus is choosing to have 72 people to go out to take this mission, to begin to expand it. Three divine, four times the earth equals 12. 72 is also, friends, divisible by two. If you're gonna send them out two by two, you've gotta have a number that is divisible by two. Now, I read two commentaries, more commentaries than that, but two commentaries were in agreement. I don't know how to back this up. I didn't drill this down, but two different sources said, at the time when Jesus is expanding his ministry, there are 72 nations known in the world. I don't know how to back that up, but if Jesus knew that, I think that's critical that he has 72 people for the 72 nations of the world. But I drilled this down even further. How many continents do we have on this planet? We've got seven continents. Seven continents. Well, you're saying seven a C. If you multiply that by 12, that's 84. Well, guess what? You've got 12 plus 72 equals 84. Maybe Jesus has a vision to take 12 disciples to every corner of the world. Maybe Jesus is, is speaking prophetically here that one day the gospel that he is proclaiming is going to go into all the world. I think that's a beautiful vision as well. And I found this week an article called Our Christian Earth, The Astounding Reach of the World's Largest Religion by a writer named Max Fisher. He's quoting the Pew Report. Listen carefully to this. Christianity is the only religion in the world with a major presence on every continent today. Friends, if you look at the Hindu faith clustered around India, if you look at the Muslim faith clustered around northern Africa and other parts of the world, but it is the Christian, I wish you had a map to see here, their Christian gospel has gone out into every continent of the world, and I believe that's Jesus' will. Let me ask you this question. Who took it there? Who took it there? People. People took the gospel to the four corners of the earth. People took the gospel to every continent. We've got Cuba represented here. We've got the Philippines represented here. We've got South Korea in the room. I wish my friends from the Congo and Africa were in the room, but those people heard the gospel of Jesus Christ because somebody preached the gospel on their continent. Praise God for that. The world is, knows Jesus and knows Christianity. Friends, we've got to remember. We've got to remember when our children think that Christianity is dying in America, that Christianity is growing all over the world. And we are taking the gospel to Africa. And we are taking the gospel to Japan. And we are taking the gospel to all the corners of the world. And we are building disciples for our Spanish-speaking friends here with Amigo Rosales here in our very own community because the gospel in Jesus' vision is to take it to the world. So people matter. People matter and friends, let me say this. He sent them out two by two. That is what Peter and John did. That's what Paul and Barnabas did. That's what Barnabas and Mark did. And I want to share with you one of my favorite passages from Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. It says this. It says that a cord of two strands is not quickly broken, right? A cord of three strands, excuse me, is not quickly broken. It says one can overpower one, but two can withstand one, uh, two, we have a good return for uh, that which is given to us for labor. If one falls, the other is there to lift up. And so I give this rope illustration to the children in the room. This looks like one rope, but it is not one rope. It is many strands. In fact, if you go to the frayed end, you begin to see the number of strands that make up this one rope. And let me say to every child in this room, every adult in this room, your mother who loved you, your mother who prayed for you, your mother who took you to church, your mother who modeled for you the reading of Scripture, the mother who was kind to others was a, a strand of strength that made the rope of your life strong. And there are women in this church that are like mothers to me, and I love them, and they have influenced me, and I praise God for them. And my life is as strong as this cord because of the many strands, and it often takes what? It takes the fraying of our lives, the difficulty of our lives, the unraveling of our lives for us to realize just how many strands God blesses us with when he brings us into the community called the church. Yes, friends, the enemy, the enemy will try to steal and kill and destroy and divide. 
But we can be strong when we are together. We must serve the Lord together. We are better together. Jesus is sending these disciples out, and he says to them, go out, knock on the doors, and say, peace be with you. And if a response comes, peace be with you also, then you know that peace is in the house. And then because of the protocols of the day and the hospitality of the Jewish faith, those individuals would most likely take you in and welcome you and feed you and care for you and build relationship with you. And then Jesus says, but if they say, if peace returns with no response, then just pass on by and go to another receptive heart. Let me say to this, be a gracious host, be a gracious guest. My mother taught me when you go to someone's house to stay and they put food before you, you eat it and you say thank you. And friends, when I was serving the church in Rockdale, Texas, and I would make my visits to the homebound and the shut-ins in the afternoon, I'd go at three and I'd go at four and then at five I'd wrap it up and at every home I'd go, someone would have a piece of cake or a piece of pie waiting for me. And then after eating pie and cake all through the afternoon, I would go home to a young mother named Gina who'd been battling kids and organizing the house all day long. She would put dinner before me. And do you think I would say, I can't eat. I've been eating cake all day. (laughs) Absolutely not. I'm amazed I'm so thin. I thank God for metabolism that I have because I would eat that dinner gladly being with my wife and my family and my children Friends, hospitality is how God works. When there's good hospitality, the kingdom of God can grow and the kingdom of God will move on. So let me just say this, hospitality is at the heart of the mission. We heard the passage from Genesis 18 today. It talked about Abraham. What did Abraham do? He saw the guests. He came, he welcomed them. He watered them. He washed their feet. He let them get into the shade and rest. And then he called Sarah to make a meal for them. And as they shared in this meal together, as Carrie mentioned in Hebrews 13, 12, he was entertaining angels unaware because those angels had a message for Abraham and Sarah. Next next year, when we come back by through here, Sarah's going to be pregnant and there'll be a baby on the way. And so we never know who we are engaging when we, oper- we give the opportunity of hospitality. There was the social code, the social covenant of Leviticus 19.34. A foreign residing among you must be treated as a native born. Love them as yourself, for you are foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. What was God saying? He was reminding the, the people of Israel, in Egypt, you were enslaved. In Egypt, you were treated poorly. Therefore, when you become my nation, when you become my people, when there is a foreigner in your midst, even if they're your enemy, you must show them hospitality. So friends, we must take the initiative. We must welcome the newcomer because it makes a difference. It's made a difference in my life. When I moved from California to Houston when I was age five, We started visiting a church, a large Presbyterian church in Houston. And as I went to that church, my parents dropped me off in my Sunday school room. And I was a shy kid. I was the new kid. And I didn't make any new friends in that Sunday school class. I remember distinctly begging my mom and dad, I don't want to go back to that church. I don't want to go back to that church. I played basketball for that that church. And I didn't get invited over to any friend's house to play. No new friendships came from playing on that basketball team. And all I'm here to say is from my own personal experience, it makes a difference when you reach out, when you show hospitality, when you welcome the stranger and you invite them into your life and you connect them with your friends. Because at age 15, I stand here today because a a friend named David took me to Memorial Drive Methodist Church, invited me into that group, invited me to connect with his friends. And when my father died 11 years ago, there were eight members of my youth group who showed up at my daddy's funeral. Friends, that happens because of friendships, deep friendships that were sowed because my friend David introduced me to his friends, and helped me break into that group. It makes a difference. And friends, I could have been Presbyterian. (laughs) But I'm thankful I'm not. I'm a good Methodist, and I love the Lord. And I thank God that I'm in the Methodist church. 
Friends, our strategic plan talks about recruiting people and showing hospitality crews. And you'll see in a moment the card that we are engaging, asking for help. We're going to be putting out a survey to our first-time guests, getting their feedback. We want to do, we want to do this better. We want to do this well. Let me just uh, close with a quick story. According to the research of Mortimer Arias, who wrote an article called Evangelism by Hospitality, get this, a Roman emperor in the first century told his governors, practice hospitality like the Christians do. And if you practice hospitality like the Christians do, the Roman government, the Roman empire will grow. I thought about that. And I saw our, uh, our Marvin Life uh, newsletter came out. I got mine on Friday at the home. You saw, I'm so glad Edwin Holtz up there in the balcony. You saw, friends, the gospel bridge is coming. On June 18th, there's going to be a party. There's going to be a celebration. It's going to be a mixture of people that will be gathering with food and with music and with the Lord as our host to celebrate just being a community together. Now, friends, I want to say to this, there will be black and white people that will be there together, and we will, I think, just be in God's presence, enjoying music and friendship and making some new friends. It'll be something different. But I want to ask you to begin today to pray for this event. I'm going to ask you today to begin to pray whether God is calling you to be at this event. You don't have to send me emails. You don't have to talk about it amongst yourselves, about what all this is about. Is there some agenda? There is not. The agenda is we've invited, right, Edwin? We've invited the Lord Almighty to be the host of this celebration. And we're going to break bread together, and we're going to sing together, and we're going to have a wonderful fellowship time together. All are invited. All are welcome. All are invited to put God in the middle of our community and see what God can do. And let me tell you, what I would love to hear is this. I want our world to love each other the way those Christians love each other. And if I hear that, I'll echo the words from the scripture lesson that Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come near. Friends, it's all about people. It's about connecting with people. It's about uh, doing the work of God and loving the individuals that God brings before us. Jesus believes in you. He needs you to reach those he's trying to reach. And hospitality matters. That's why people is such an important strategic pillar in our future. As we advance the kingdom of God, let's invest in those who have an open heart and are receptive. People. Jesus loves them. He calls them. He equips them. He sends them. Lord Jesus, send us out into this harvest because we want to gather in those you are trying to reach. And friends, when you came to church today, you were given a card. It says, how will I serve? There'll be opportunities for you to strengthen our hospitality ministry. I hope and pray that before you leave the service today, you'll consider it. If God's prompting your heart, you'll check a box, hand it to an usher, hand it to me, drop it in a basket, We'll be calling, a, calling on you because we want to be the church that is reaching the world for Jesus Christ. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Pray. Pray that the God of the harvest will call us to help him do his work. Amen and amen.
righteousness should live unto righteousness that we Thank you for watching our broadcast this morning. I'd like to personally invite you to join us for Sunday morning services at 8.30 and 11 o'clock on our campus at 300 West Roman Street, downtown Tyler. I hope you'll visit our website to learn more about our church and its ministry and serving opportunities. And if we can be of any assistance in your spiritual growth, I hope you'll contact us here at Marvin Church. If you'd like to contribute to the local or international ministry of Marvin, please contact Robin Thomason through the information provided on the screen. Thank you again for watching and may God bless you.